Instagram.com. Really excited to tell you about a new study that was just published. There is a dichotomy between day and night. During the day, we've always said that you really need to have bright light exposure to your eyes in order to really sink in and have anchored your circadian rhythm. And I'd also add to that, by the way, a lot of the videos that we've talked about, that there's more to the sun than just light in the eyes. There's also near-infrared radiation. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But at night, we've also shown that it's really important to not have any kind of light coming in to your eyes because it can shut down melatonin production. And melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants known to man, and it's really important to have that melatonin. By the way, near-infrared radiation may also stimulate melatonin in the mitochondria of cells. So that's another topic. Now, what evidence do we have for this dichotomy and the need for it? There's been up to this point observational studies. This one was published last year looking at China, and they were actually looking at satellite photographs of the light at night in different regions of China. And what they did was they associated this with mortality in China. And they looked at, in this study, 579 counties with an average daily light at night of 4.39 on the scale that they used. And then they correlated it with cause of mortality, and they found that a positive association between light at night and all-cause-specific mortality was observed, of which the strongest effect was observed on mortality caused by neuron system disease. That was tantalizing. The relative risk was 1.32, meaning a 32% increase, and notice that the confidence interval did not include one, which made it statistically significant. Their conclusion was, and again, this is an epidemiological study, that light at night is associated with mortality in China, particularly for neuron system disease-related mortality. These findings have important implications for public health policy establishment to minimize the health consequences of light pollution. This is an associative study. Association doesn't necessarily mean causation. For instance, people who may be less healthy are living in cities where there are lights, and maybe that has to do with their income. Maybe that has to do with a whole host of other things that's actually predicting mortality. We have to be wary of that. The other problem here is that light outside of a dwelling doesn't really tell us exactly how much light the person is getting themselves. Looking at satellites can tell us a little bit about the light environment, but not everything. Okay. Excited to enter this study, which was just published this month, titled Brighter Nights and Darker Days Predict Higher Mortality Risk, a Prospective Analysis of Personal Light Exposure in Greater Than 88,000 Individuals. So this is a paper out of the University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and they actually looked at the UK, specifically the UK Biobank data. This was 88,905 subjects, and they actually wore a light sensor watch for one week. This is not light looking at outside. This is personal light coming to the subject. This was only for one week, but they actually validated this in 3,000 subjects and took repeated measurements four times, and it didn't change. One week is actually pretty good at establishing how much light somebody's going to get for the next eight years. And that's exactly what they did, was they tracked these people to see what happened to them in terms of mortality for the next eight years. And the results are pretty astounding. So first of all, let me break this down. There's a lot of data on this screen. I want to go through it piecemeal. So there's three models. There's model one, model two, and model three. Model one adjusts for age, sex, ethnicity, and photo period. Model two, in addition to adjusting for age, sex, ethnicity, photo period, also adds to it employment status, education, income, and deprivation. Model three adds, in addition to all of those, physical activity, smoking status, alcohol consumption, urbanicity, and social activity. The reference here is looking at light exposure. We know that light exposure at night is bad, and so any increase in that is going to have an increase in mortality. But that light exposure during the day is actually good. So our reference range here is 0 to 50% light. Notice that in each one of these cases, whether it's day or night, the reference or the control is people getting anywhere from 0 to 50% of the light of that population. And so therefore, you can see here that we have a dash because that's the control. 
Now, from there, we're going to divide it into those that got 50 to 70%, so that means more light, 70 to 90%, even more light, and then 90 to 100%, the most light. Now, the reason why they did this is to show a dose-dependent increase, because if you can show in association that you have a dose-response curve, that is highly suggestive of causation. So let's take a look at this. In model one that looked at just these confounders, what did we see? We saw that those that got more light at night than the reference range had a hazard ratio that was slightly elevated in terms of all-cause mortality, but it included the number one and was not statistically significant. At night, if we went to 70 to 90%, that means even more light. Notice now that we're starting to break out. It starts to become statistically significant. And we have a hazard ratio of a 17% increase in mortality just by having that much light at night. At 90 to 100%, that means the most amount of light at night. Notice now very statistically significant and a 34% increase in mortality. Looking at the same increases of light, not in terms of lux, but in terms of percentile, notice what happens during the day. It's completely different. In fact, it goes in the opposite direction. 50 to 70% increase above the reference range, which was 0 to 50, is going to reduce mortality down to 0.84, or a 16% reduction. Notice that that was statistically significant. We go to 70 to 90%. Now we're down to 74%, which is a 26% reduction in mortality. That's also statistically significant. 90 to 100%, now we're down to 0.66. That is highly statistically significant. So notice that light during the day is very important. It's almost even more important than avoiding light at night, but that is also important. Let's go to model two. Now we're going to take out even more confounders. So we might expect these differences to start to become more muted. And in fact, that's what we start to see, but not by much. So notice again, in terms of light at night, 50 to 70%, which is just above the reference range, not statistically significant. 70 to 90%, we have an 18% increase in mortality. 90 to 100%, we have a 31% increase in mortality, both statistically significant. During the day, we should notice an improvement, and we do. 50 to 70%, just slightly more light during the day, actually gets us a 14% reduction in mortality. That is statistically significant. 70 to 90%, we get a 24% reduction in mortality. That's statistically significant. 90 to 100%, look at this, amazing. We see once again a huge reduction in mortality. In this case, it's a 32% reduction, statistically significant. Let's go to model three, where we're having all of these confounders that are factored into the situation, plus physical activity, smoking status, alcohol consumption. Let's see what happens now. So at night, when we don't want to be having light, we have 50 to 70%. What happens here? Notice that this is not statistically significant anymore because it includes the number one. We have to go to 70 to 90% of the light at night, and you will see a 15% increase in mortality, which is statistically significant. We go to 90 to 100%, we have a 21% increase. That's highly statistically significant. What about during the day? In comparison to 0 to 50% in the reference range, 50 to 70% has a 10% reduction in mortality. That's barely statistically significant. 70 to 90%, we have a 16% reduction in mortality, highly statistically significant. 90 to 100, we have, again, a 17% reduction in mortality, highly statistically significant. This shows that the more light you're exposed to during the day, and the least amount of light that you're exposed to at night is highly conducive to living a long time. The best way to get the most amount of light during the day is not to be inside because the typical amount of lux that you're getting when you're inside is about 50 to 100. And when you're outside on a bright sunny day, it could be anywhere from 10,000 lux all the way up to 100,000 lux. So much, much better in terms of light outside. Now, here's another way of looking at it. We're looking at model one. Let's just concentrate on looking at all-cause mortality for now. We're looking at the same groups. We're looking at 90 to 100, 70 to 90, and 50 to 70. And the reference range is 0 to 50. So here we have 90 to 100. Here we have 70 to 90. And here we have 50 to 70. Notice that if it's highly statistically significant that it's a dark triangle, Somewhat statistically significant, it is a dark circle, 
But if it's not statistically significant, it's an open circle like this. So now what we can do is we can go to the hour of the day and figure out when sunlight is statistically significant beneficial for someone and when light at night is statistically significantly bad for somebody. So let's look at all-cause mortality. And if you notice here, in Model 1, which did not take a lot of confounders into consideration, at the very highest amount of sun exposure, whether it is during the day or at night, you can see here that there is statistical significance. As it gets to be around midnight, in this case, you can see here that light tended to drop the mortality. But notice that there was an even bigger drop right about 9 o'clock. So before 9 o'clock, light was very good in terms of dropping mortality, but once you hit 9 o'clock, it almost didn't make a difference. After 12 o'clock, there was a huge problem with having light in your eyes after 12 o'clock until you reach about 7 o'clock in the morning, and then you go down to this negative where light in the eyes is very protective. Let's go to 70 to 90 percent. It's obviously much more muted because less light during the day is going to cause you to have less of a mortality. It's going to be closer to the unity. Less light at night, those are open circles. So those are not even statistically significant. Notice even further that when we get down to even less light, there's hardly any differences either on one side or the other, of course, because we're getting close to the reference range. Light at night, again, open circles, meaning not statistically significant. What does that mean? Even just a little bit of light, if you can avoid light, you might be able to avoid an increase in mortality. Let's jump to Model 3. Model 3 was the one that took the most amount of confounders into consideration. I think this is actually a pretty good one. It's probably the most realistic look at it. Let's look at 90 to 100%. That's where we're getting a lot of sun exposure. Notice that once you hit about 7 or 8 o'clock at night, bright light exposure is not statistically significantly going to change much. You really need to have that bright light. According to this, it looks like around 6 or 7 o'clock at night. That's when you're going to start to get the most amount of mortality benefit with sunlight into your eyes. So looking at the sun at around sunset is best. After that, light is not really going to do much. Notice that if you have the most amount of sunlight, or most amount of light, I should say, at night, that's still going to cause an increase in mortality during these hours. And once again, in the morning, getting a lot of bright light into your eyes is also going to be very statistically significantly beneficial at reducing all-cause mortality. Let's look at the moderate amount of light, the 70 to 90 percent. That's this one right here. Notice here, it really doesn't matter much at all in terms of statistical significance. What matters the most here is getting even 70 to 90 percent between the hours of 8 o'clock in the morning and 1600 still is going to improve mortality. And again, when we look at here at even 50 to 70 percent, the story here is most of your statistical significance is during the day and getting any amount of light that you can get, it's going to reduce mortality. You can see this repeated all throughout, whether it's all-cause, cardiometabolic mortality, or other-cause mortality. Again and again and again, what we're seeing here is getting the most amount of light that you possibly can during the day going outside is very beneficial. This is not any different than what we've talked about on previous lectures, where we've talked about the Sweden study, which showed that Swedish women, about 30,000 of them, avoided the sun compared to those that actively sought out the sun. There was a big difference in mortality. In fact, the magnitude of that was so much so that women in Sweden that avoided the sun and did not smoke had the same mortality as women in Sweden who actively went after the sun and did smoke. They had the same mortality. By the way, there was another UK Biobank study that also showed, in terms of ultraviolet radiation, the same findings, that those that had more time outside, more time getting sunlight, had lower mortalities. What I think would be really interesting is if we could somehow break up this light exposure into its components to see how much of this light is actually infrared light, sunlight, or artificial light. All of this caused the authors of this paper to say, these findings demonstrate the importance of maintaining a dark environment across late night and early morning hours when the central circadian pacemaker is most sensitive to light and seeking bright light during the day to enhance circadian rhythms. By the way, they say here to enhance circadian rhythms, which is absolutely true. But I would also add to that the growing amount of data that we have that shows that infrared light from the sun does actually have benefits on mitochondrial dysfunction.
They go on to say that protection of lighting environments may be especially important in those at risk for both circadian disruption and mortality, such as in intensive care or aged care settings. And that really hits home for me because sometimes I do work in the intensive care even at night, and I am now very keenly sensitive to the fact that this may actually be impacting my mortality. There's many shift workers that work at night, and this should also give them pause as well. Across the general population, avoiding nightlight and seeking daylight may lead to reduction in disease burden, especially cardiometabolic diseases, and may increase longevity. And as this video is coming out now in the fall leading into winter, this is the flu season. This is when we potentially may be having more viral illnesses. It behooves us to listen to this and to even more make a concerted effort to get outside into sunshine. So I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you did like it, please subscribe, leave a comment, turn on notifications, and also join us at medcram.com where we have continuing medical education units, things like understanding how to insert chest tubes and run those, EKG, echocardiography, point of care ultrasound, vasopressors, and how to run ventilators. These are all courses that we offer and they explain things clearly. Thanks for joining us.